has extended themselves in remarkable ways on behalf of this campaign, far beyond anything we could reasonably expect or ask. We've got two more weeks of hard work ahead of us. Lots of doors. Lots of doors we got to knock. Lots of calls we have to make. Still a few more checks that we can write. But I'll say this, tonight we had a spring in our step. Yeah. The wind is at our back. We've got the truth on our side. And, and best of all, Elvis is in the house. <laughs> So we are thrilled to join with each of you in welcoming one of the greatest living Americans and one of the truly great citizens of the world. And we know that we will be joining with you again on the evening of November 5th, when on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of people who are counting on us to be their advocates and their champions, we win a great victory. about my first experience with Bill Clinton, because it will illustrate the important relationship that, uh, that he and I have. <laughs> the year was 1992. I was a, a grad student up in Massachusetts studying government and public policy. And remember back then, the Democrats had lost five out of six presidential elections, four of them by landslides. And the political science, the science literature was filled with hand-wringing about the demise of the National Democratic Party. I literally had no memory of a Democrat winning the White House. I was six years old when Jimmy Carter got elected. So for me, the idea of a Democrat in the White House was kind of like winning the lottery. You know, you know it's theoretically possible, but you better not plan your retirement around. And then along came the governor of Arkansas. And I remember watching every single word of his announcement speech in Little Rock and thinking to myself, this is the guy we've been waiting for. He spoke about the forgotten middle class. He connected the threads of community and responsibility and opportunity into a coherent structure for governance. He linked the values of the Democratic Party to the aspirations and the hopes of the American people in a way that everybody could understand. And that was a remarkable thing. So what is this important relationship that we have? I took a chance on this obscure governor of Arkansas. <laughs> I crossed the border over into New Hampshire in order to volunteer in the Democratic primary, ringing a few doorbells. I'm pretty sure that I persuaded at least one elderly couple in Nashua to come over to our side. And ladies and gentlemen, as a consequence, I can reveal to you tonight that I am solely and exclusively responsible for Bill Clinton being the President of the United States. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I hope he's laughing, but I'm a little afraid to laugh. <laughs> so, of course, in truth, I may have exaggerated just a little bit. Because it was millions of people who were inspired to get involved. And more than that, it was the singular drop and energy and talent and vision of our candidate that made the difference. And so from the moment Ohio put him over the top just a few minutes before 11 p.m. on election night, and in all the days since, including a remarkable post-presidential career, Bill Clinton has always been for me, and for so many of us, the man who led our party and our progressive values out of the wilderness. America 
and the world on a better path forward. And just as importantly, more importantly, he did it for the right reasons. Because what Bill Clinton has always understood is that you don't run for office to hold office. You run for office to accomplish things. That's what justifies every handshake, every compromise, every pitch for money, every complex issue that's reduced to a slogan. It's what you do when you have the chance. And it's in that space that you engineer the longest peacetime expansion in our entire history, with 22 million new jobs. It's in that that you deliver the first balanced budget in a generation and the last one we've seen since. It's in that space that you expand the earned income tax credit to lift millions of families out of poverty and that you adopt SCHIP to provide health insurance to millions of children. It's in that space that you give hope to the people of Northern Ireland and Kosovo. And in the years since leaving the White House, it's in that space that you provide for healthier, better lives for nearly half a billion people all around the globe. That is what Bill Clinton has done for America. And show all of us who care about public service that for all the craziness in this process, it is worth it. It is worth it. We plow through the 80% that is nonsense in order to wrap our arms around the 20% that truly matters. And on a vastly smaller scale, that's the same test we have to apply to ourselves here in Westchester County. Because it's not me who counts. It's not Rob Astorino who counts. It's the parents who want to work and need childcare in order to be able to hold on to a job. It's the, women. it's the women who deserve to be able to access medical care without fear of intimidation or bullying. It's the families who know that the government values their safety above the dictates of the gun lobby. And it's cares about the strength of our economy and having a tax bill that we can actually afford and having a healthy environment. Those are the stakes. You know, during this campaign, many of you have heard me talk about my parents and their long journey in their lives. Refugees in the Second World War who fled from Poland to Russia to Central Asia to Israel came to the United States with very little beyond a fierce belief in education and faith in a free society. Lived in Manhattan, in Washington Heights, where they raised my three older brothers. But it wasn't until they came to Westchester that they were truly home. This is the place that they chose. I have never considered living anywhere else. And Katie and I won our boys and everyone's children, whatever their challenges and circumstances, to have the same sense of possibility, the same belief that this is a place where you can make a good life. What Bill Clinton taught us and proved over and over again is that we are going up or down together that we have a stake in the success of our neighbors, and that every single one of us, every single day, counts and is to be valued. And if we demonstrate courage and vision and intelligence, then you better believe our best days are still ahead. So lots and lots of us were thrilled and honored when the president and his much better half <laughs> like my parents, and like so many others, chose to make Westchester their home. And it seems to me that the least we can do for Bill Clinton in return 
is elect a county executive who voted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, that was a great speech. <laughs> you don't need any help from me. I have to say that uh, I did suggest that he ask all of his relatives to stand up because when they came through, and including Katie and her family, and then we all took a picture together, they almost couldn't get us all in. <laughs> And as you all drifted away, I said, no, I am in Bowen West Chester County. <laughs> he smiled, he said, all of them are old enough. <laughs> and I said, you're home. <laughs> you get your kin folks to vote for you, you can't lose. <laughs> I am honored to be here. I do want to acknowledge uh, the presence in the audience of two members of Congress who, for very different reasons, I feel very close to. First, Representative Ellen Engel. Ellen uh, Engel went through, he is the only person here who can honestly say he has endured both the shutdowns of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama <laughs> and lived to tell the tale. He came up to me tonight and he said, you know, after we went through that in 95, he said, I didn't think they could get any crazier, but they are. <laughs> and Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. <laughs> and I am especially proud because he worked for me for many years in the White House, and he is carrying on that legacy of public service. Thanks to the voters of this area, and I, I thank you for that. You know, Hillary and I live in Chappaqua. We vote in Westchester County. I just voted absentee in the election. You already got one vote. <laughs> <laughs> you went on with me just like you were in New Hampshire. I'm going to say, I did it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a near one thing in New Hampshire. You might be interested to know that you were the second person in a week to take credit for my election. <laughs> because I was just in Florida seeing a friend of mine who was very badly injured but is on the mend in a tragic uh, car wreck. And he's coming back and uh, he was hurt in Palm Beach. And uh, one of my favorite people on earth, the great baseball player Hank Aaron, has a place there. And he's very close to me. He and his wife are good friends of pillars of mine. And on the weekend before the election in Georgia, we had a rally in 1992 in a football stadium at a high school just outside of Atlanta. 25,000 people showed up. That's how many seats there were in the football stadium. He filled it. And I carried the state by 13,000. <laughs> so for 21 years now, I have heard Hank Aaron every time I see him. So. <laughs> First, I broke Babe Ruth's record, then I elected Bill Clinton. <laughs> and I, uh, I hope my absentee vote will enable me to say the same thing about your wonderful candidate. I, I want to say a couple of things here. There's a mega reason and a Westchester specific reason that this man should be our next county executive. And I, I want to try to put this in 
into some context. When I ran for president the first time, I knew I would be the first president, if I were to win, whose entire service would be at the end of the Cold War. When a reassuring, if oversimplified, curtain was lifted from the world that allowed us to imagine for decades that as dangerous as it was the Cold War, at least we were organized. And clearly divided, and we all knew what was happening. After that, it became painfully apparent that the number one characteristic of the 21st century world, whether globally or within America or within Westchester County, is our interdependence. That all boundaries look more like nets than walls. And that interdependence means we can't get away from each other. But it can be good or bad. Human nature being what it is, it's normally both. So here we are with the president and other national leaders struggling with a world and a country that is highly interdependent. The good news is that an eight-year-old can get on the internet and find out in 30 seconds what I had to go to college to learn. <laughs> right? The bad news is that a terrorist can get on the internet and find out in 30 seconds how to make a car bomb. And the good news is that this borderless world has brought to Westchester County vast diversity. Look around, this crowd is much more diverse than it would have been if we'd had this event 30 years ago. And our county is the stronger for it. But it also means that two guys came over here from Dagestan, a tiny province in Russia, got an education, things were going well. One of them did get picked for a soccer team, went home and got converted by radicals into the cause of, of basically suicide bombing and did what he did at the Boston Marathon with his little brother helping him. Ruining one life, taking another, and then having all the carnage that was wreaked on innocent people. So the whole world now is in a constant struggle between people who are trying to put things together and people who are trying to take things apart. They're not all violent. I don't want to compare apples and oranges here. But if you think about it, the struggles of the 21st century world are struggles about pulling things together or taking things apart. There are times when all of us kind of cheer for the taking things apart deal. When the Arab Spring began, for example, all those people were in the square, Tahrir Square in Cairo, they seemed, all those young people were so impressive. But we were quickly reminded that it's easier to take something down than to build something up. And if you don't have an alternative building, the alternative might be quite destructive. Now, what's all I got to do with this? America's part of global jobs crisis, focused in two areas. Young people and middle-aged people without special education, either a college degree or a particular skill that's still relevant. Power is more dispersed, but wealth is more concentrated, so inequality is too high. Median, that's the one in the middle, not average. Median <laughs> family income in America is lower today than it was the day I left office. To get it back, you have to do what you always do, the only way you can raise incomes is to have more jobs, that's a tighter labor market, and then change the job mix so there are more people in upper income range. Now, that's just one example. But a problem like that yields to a certain kind of decision making in government and in the private sector and in the world I live in, non-governmental organizations. It yields to getting everybody together, getting the best ideas in the room, and being creative and cooperative. Unfortunately, in politics, and sometimes in conflict, as you see in Syria and elsewhere, people who are interested in constant combat sometimes do better. But they never get a good result. 
So basically, you have the cooperation model and the conflict model. It's not so liberal and conservative as it is radical and mainstream, as it is cooperation versus conflict. I mean, if you look at Noam's record as mayor, you certainly don't have to keep a Republican county executive to keep Westchester County taxes as low as possible because his city has the lowest taxes in Westchester County. And the leanest government. <laughs> so you don't have to do it for fiscal responsibility. But the question is, how would you deal with challenges? His opponent dealt with the challenges of a tough budget by cutting out support for child care, which made it harder for working families from modest incomes, and closing community health centers, which I can tell you is terrible now and will put enormous pressure once we do get the computer glitches worked out on the <laughs> health care thing and everybody signs up. We need those community health centers because that's the place where people can come and get their primary. So, even if you're like Hillary and me and you've got great insurance and your heart goes on the blank and you can go down to Columbia and get a heart bypass, <laughs> we need, if you believe we're all in this together, we need those community health centers. So what did he propose? Did he say, oh, the guy's a slug for closing the community health centers? and getting rid of the child care things. He said, no, we do have to save money. Here's a better idea. Put our planning board back. Help the local governments to plan an efficient and more sustainable future where they use less energy, lower their taxpayer bills, and help the environment. Even more immediate, set up cost area where the county can join with cities and school districts and buy supplies at much lower cost because they'll be buying in bulk. And somebody with market power will be bargaining for lower cost. That's a lot better than clothing health clinics and taking child care support away from working families. <laughs> they both save you money, but one approach tends to divide people and aggravate inequality. The other approach tends to bring us together and create more opportunity. If you look at the different budget choices, that tells you all you need to know about this race. You don't have to get mad at anybody. You don't have to call anybody a name. You don't have to threaten to shut the government down. You don't have to say, I wish somebody would abrogate the full faith and credit of America for the first time in more than 200 years. Just look which works better. His way works better. big county. So national issues that might not count in small, highly homogenous counties do matter here. And I think it matters that he supports the constitutional mandate of Roe v. Wade. And <laughs> it matters that Westchester County should stand up for sensible gun safety laws. <laughs> that it's gotten so bad in Washington that when a conservative Democrat, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, with a 100% voting record with the NRA, and a conservative Republican, Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, with a 100% voting record with the NRA, said, look, you cannot possibly justify doing background checks if you go buy a gun in a gun store and not doing them at gun shows and internet sales. There is no reasonable basis for that, and we know it makes a difference. And I read a stunning article the other day, by the way, by a guy who was in prison for killing someone who got all caught up in the gang culture and the guy was totally uh, 
He had none of this poor me. He said, look, I am where I belong. I did a terrible thing. I'm being punished for it, and I should be. But I know a lot about how guns get on the street and into the hands of gangs and kids who don't know any better start shooting. And don't you believe these background checks don't make a difference? They do. Yeah. And so, I don't know why we're promoting gun shows when they beat the background check law. But I know that if the mayor were county executive, he'd take a different approach. Maybe he could even get some of these people to agree to background checks at the gun show in return for doing it and begin to change America. We have to decide whether we're going forward with a cooperation model or a conflict model. And all I can tell you is, I, you know, we, my foundation sells the world's least expensive high quality AIDS and malaria medicine in 70 countries. We work on building health systems and dealing with a lot of big health challenges and helping poor small farmers in about 40 countries all over the world. Here's what I know. Every place in America and around the world that's doing well today is doing well because there's creating cooperation. Every place that is dominated by conflict where identity politics are the order of the day. Sometimes some people are winning, but more people are losing. They're not doing well. I was in Orlando the other day. You know Orlando is Disney World, right? I took, when Hillary and I took Chelsea to Disney World, one of our greatest experiences when, when she was a little kid, but Orlando is the home of five billion dollars worth of NASA and Defense Department research. The home of Disney World and Universal Entertainment Studios and the home of the video game division of global entertainment arts. What do they have in common? They all need good computer simulation. It's cheaper to send somebody to take a rocket ship up or fly a jet airplane or drive a tank on a simulator than the real deal and it's safer. They need computer simulations at the parks to make the rides and other things exciting. And if, like me, you have ever been addicted to one of those video games, you know that they have to keep improving the computer simulation so that your addiction will be maintained. <laughs> we were laughing, but it's true, right? So what happened in our life? Why are they back? Why are they in better shape than they were before the crisis? They have 100, 100 computer simulation companies there. And their university, the University of Central Florida, the largest unknown school in America, <laughs> is now the second largest undergraduate institution in the United States. I can't remember, it's either, I think Ohio State or Michigan. One of them has a few more undergraduates than they did. They are almost at 50,000 undergraduates. Why? Because the university trains people to do all this work and hires professors to come up with new ideas and they license them to the companies and they get money for the university and they created this cycle of prosperity and opportunity, creating more jobs and changing the job mix up. That's what we have to do in America. I can give you lots of other examples. That's what they're doing with human genome research in San Diego. That's what they're trying to do in places that are not as well known like Kansas City and and um, Knoxville, Tennessee by creating the fastest broadband service in the world in their area. It all requires cooperation. This guy's smart. You heard the speech he just gave. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a record of doing that. Thank you. you know, I'm not running for anything. I'm very grateful for how good Westchester has been to Hillary and to me, more than I can say. But I can tell you this, when your service is over, 